of Halloween, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Nonprofit Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films has voted 10 Golden Scroll Awards of Merit for Outstanding Achievement to Halloween. It's all to the director, Mr. Klumpeter, who I believe has won two Saturn Awards from the Science Fiction Fantasy Horror Academy. And it's my honor to announce the name of the recipients of this masterful film. I was trained by the Jesuits, so since I was young, a teenager, I saw horror films as not only entertainment and joy, but as like a medieval morality play brought up to date. Halloween is one of the great masterpieces of the horror genre. And though I'm in my middle 60s and grew up with seven-year-old seeing Dracula and all those great classic uh, universal horrors of the 1930s, um, I loved Halloween when I saw it 22 years ago. And as I say, it's our tour. Mr. Uh, Carpenter has won two Golden Saturn Awards. And uh, I know James Cameron, who's a dues-paying member, has gotten eight, but I still think two is better than one. And so I'm delighted to read all the names of the recipients of the 10 Golden Scrolls. And you'll, you'll forgive me if I sit down. Okay, Mr. Carpenter hasn't come to join us, uh, so I'll just read off the names. Uh, Dennis, should I give them all to you? Or what? Okay, let's start with the names. You might want to see what they look like. They look like this is Golden Scroll Award of Merit for Outstanding Achievement. It bears the corporate, corporation seal of honor and my signature. The first winner is their representative of Anchor Bay Entertainment here. We voted Anchor Bay one because there's got so much to promote the film. If they're not, you give it to Dennis, or to Mary, and the Dean. So that's the first one. It's tested because most of them will be here. So Golden Scroll Award of Merit to Dean Kundi. Is he here? Join us here this evening. Uh, first, will you please join me in welcoming 
the film's producer and co-writer, who later went on to produce a number of wonderful films, including The Fisher King, Escape from New York, some tremendous movies, Miss Deborah Hill. John Carpenter, I suppose, is not here. We've been working with him for the last couple of weeks at his shooting schedule. Um, I, he's shooting his movie, Ghost of Mars. They had hoped that today that they were going to reorganize the schedule so that he would get here during his dinner hour. Apparently, he's, he's not here. Hopefully, he'll show up. Um, but, you know, shooting has to take priority over events like this. But I know in his heart, he thanks the fans the cast and the crew for all the work that they have done, and particularly the fans for having been around for 22 years. So on behalf of John, I thank you. Please join me welcome a wonderful actress, the star of Halloween, along with A Fish Called Wanda, Trading Places, True Lies, so many tremendous films, Miss Jamie Lee Curtis. Woo! of Halloween, Carrie, Stripes, Miss P.J. Souls. <laughs> Please join me welcome an extremely talented actress who was in not only Halloween 1, but Halloween 2 and 3, Miss Nancy Kais. Welcoming the gentleman who actually came up with the initial concept for Halloween, which was at that point called the Babysitter Murders, Mr. Erwin Yablons. The cinematographer for Halloween, who was really one of the legendary cinematographers working in the past three decades, Mr. Dean Cundy. of Halloween, including production designer, art director, co-editor, Mr. Tommy Lee Wallace. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, an extra unannounced guest. <laughs> one additional. Chair and microphone, we can get one. Uh, please join me in welcoming the gentleman who played the shape in the film, Mr. Nick Castle. didn't get a golden certificate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take care of that later. I can't imagine when the last time all of you were together in one time and place with probably the production of the film. There are more people here tonight. Could you, would you like well, to introduce I, I, some of the other are, people? There, there are a few more people that I know of for sure, then there are probably some people who I don't know of, and then there are some wonderful sort of offshoot people. And you know what we're going to do when the uh, panel's done is we're going to invite them all up here for group picture. I love that. Just so you know who's here, Nancy Stevens, who played the nurse. In one. In one. Oh, yeah. And hey. is Sandy Fuego. Say hello. that 
child. Make the ambulance is here. Lonnie. here from the sequels that I never had anything to do with, but very hot. There's at least one person here, I know, and maybe he, the other one left, but the one person who is directly responsible on some level for getting H2O into turning into H2O is Kevin Williamson, yeah. and he's here. was here, um, and just for a curio, Nancy Stevens's husband <laughs> is and was Rick Rosenthal, the man who directed Halloween 2. Superman and the young girl who played uh, Little Red Riding Hood on the street, <laughs> who happened to be my son and daughter. <laughs> concept for the film on a plane coming back from Europe. Could you just describe how it came into your head and, and how you saw the film and got in touch with John Carpenter? Well, this was a, this was a project born of uh, inspiration and uh, desperation. Uh, I had formed a company with Joe Wolf and with Sipicad called Compass International Pictures. And we were a distribution company, but there was a fatal flaw in our plan didn't have the film industry. <laughs> we had seen a film uh, called Siege by a young film student named John Carter. I thought it was brilliant. We agreed to distribute it. It didn't do as well as we'd hoped. And so I took it to Europe in the hopes of making some foreign sales. It, that was not very successful there as well. And on the way home, I stopped in London and stayed at the Hilton Hotel one evening. And uh, I got a phone call from the lobby from a man I had never heard of, and he said to me, Hello, my name is Michael Myers, and I'd like to talk to you about a siege. And I wanted to dismiss him, but he came up and we had a quick conversation. He thought the picture was brilliant. He wanted to enter it into the uh, London Film Festival. By that time, we called it Assault on Precinct 13. It was an instant smash. Indicated. And as I flew home from London, I thought to myself, there must be a way to make a film with this young man, and I, I don't know what it could be, but I, I thought about this horror film about a babysitter murder type film, and it germinated. It was a long flight. I got home, and the thought of Halloween came to my mind, because it could be done in one night. It was a night that sort of synthesized all horror, and I thought to myself, I'm sure it's been used before. So I, I called John Carver that night. As soon as I got my bags packed, my wife was watched me do it right from the bed, and I said to her, I said to John, John, what do you think about this horror film of Halloween? We do it all in one night, babysitter murders. He sparked it, he understood it immediately. We met the next day, uh, we talked about it, I mentioned that I wanted to be a theater of the mind, you know, like Inner Sanctum or radio shows of that nature. He talked about this young, talented person that he collaborated with called Deborah Hill, who would write the script, and who would work with him and produce the film. John, do whatever you like, as long as you make this picture in four weeks. We didn't have the money, though. And that's a long story, but the bottom line is we got a man named Mustafa Khan. 
And the rest is history. Uh, I, 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 I can tell you only this. We gave John and Deborah very severe parameters. Four weeks, $300,000, you stretch three and a quarter to get down to plus, just class the film up. <laughs> <laughs> and they went out and did that and more, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. Now, Deborah, you co-wrote the script. You actually wrote, I believe, the, the first draft of the film, working with John Carpenter. You had worked together before on Salt and Precinct 13. Could you tell how you first met John Carpenter, and then what was your approach to, to writing Halloween, because you had to do it so quickly? Well, John and I worked on Assault and Precinct 13, along with Tommy and Nancy, and Joe Kaufman, who happens to be here, who's the producer of that. Um, and um, I was the script supervisor, and John and I began a relationship that has been, I guess, 22 years, actually more than that since Assault. Uh, we've done pictures like El Diablo together, all kinds of stuff. So, um, so we had a very, very long collaboration, and it wasn't until after we returned home from the London Film Festival, and we we're talking about babysitter murders. I had been a babysitter, so I knew a lot about that. And it was when the night that that Irwin called our home and talked about the concept of Halloween, it really, really gelled, because we could go back, take this really, truly scary sort of this night that we had all grown up with and we could figure out what the scares were. So um, Erwin's idea was just brilliant and it really gave truth to what the babysitter story was. And I, like you said, had been a babysitter. I grew up on movies like Beast with Five Fingers and The Thing and, and you know, um, Crawling Creeping, crawling, ter crawling eyes, no, what is it, Creeping Terror, Crawling Eyes, and all these kinds of movies that I just loved as a kid. And we wanted to incorporate that ki those kinds of scares the Alfred Hitchcock scares, like from Psycho, etc. So essentially, John and I started writing. I wrote much of the girls' dialogue, the totally. <laughs> and um, John wrote really the Donald Pleasance uh, dialogue. I mean, he really wrote the voice of evil. And of course, we named the shade after our distributor of Assault of Precinct 13, Michael Myers, who has <laughs> since passed away, but for, it's just been really an inspiration. Um, we wrote the script in, in three weeks. Um, I would write, I would start with a blank page, write the babysitting stuff, but would put scenes in where Sam Loomis would talk and would talk about the evil of Michael Myers and all that, and John would fill that in. He's a brilliant editor, same way we did Escape from L.A. Um, we, um, we wrote it for three weeks. We brought it to Irwin and Mustafa, who immediately started cash flowing the picture. Um, Chuck Binder brought uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and PJ Souls to my attention. Um, Jamie's audition, I, I remember this so very clearly meeting her and her energy. She was absolutely the perfect uh, girl to play uh, Laurie Strode. And, and she was just brilliant. I remember her. One of the things, one of the first auditions that Jamie did was when she was on the phone. Remember that? And, and, <laughs> oh yeah. And, and she did something that most actresses don't do is they hide their, what most actresses do is they hide their phone their face with the phone. She didn't. She revealed herself. She screamed. She did all the right things. And I really <laughs> expose yourself very well. Expose her face. Anyway, and then we hired uh, PJ and there was never we wrote the role for, of Annie for Nancy. Um, uh, so we had our three girls and we had our script. Uh, we had Erwin and Mustafa supporting and Joe supporting us uh, as young filmmakers. It's about go and make the movie. And so that's how it came about. I mean, it was really a, a blessing. Now, Jamie Lee, you were working on a TV series at the time um, when you did this Operation Petticoat. Um, I actually had been fired from the TV series. <laughs> so this was a fortuitous bit of casting. Everything in my life has been fortuitous. <laughs> I, I josh you not. Every single thing that has ever happened to me in my professional life has been fortuitous. What was your first impression, do you remember, when you read the script and met with John Carpenter and Deborah Hill? Well, you make it sound like an offer. It was sort of like, you know, read the script and then come talk to us. I mean, you have to understand that this was a tiny little movie and it was a complete audition process. So it was, it was not when you say met with them. I was like, you know, <laughs> met with them. You know, they, they have to understand that the production offices were tiny and, you know, minuscule. Cheap. John's office was tiny and minuscule and there, you know, it was on Coenga Boulevard in, in Hollywood. It was not glamorous. 
And, you know, I mean, it, all I remember was being terrified and, you know, nervous, obviously. And, um, you know, it was a big thing for me that my name was on every single, I mean, not my name, but the character's name, was on every page of a script. And, you know, at the time, I'd been fighting for one line on a TV show called Operation Petticoat, where there were five women trapped on a Navy, five Army nurses trapped on a Navy sub, where every week we had to go, Captain, when are we getting off the ship? And the problem is that they would break up that line into five parts. <laughs> so I was just about to stick my tits out and wearing this kind of like Navy uniform and going, Captain, when are we? And then, you know, somebody else would finish the line. So for me to see a script where Lori, 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 Lori was a huge opportunity for me. I was 19 years old. And, and so for me, what I remember is being terrified, seeing that character's name a lot. and. Um, um, you know, really, just that was that was my impression. Now, you all, when I say you all, the three actresses here, had to draw on some primal terrors in the film. One of the, the big challenges of acting in a horror film is to, in fact, look like you're scared. How did you work out that with John Carpenter? How were you able to sort of, you know, be scared on cue, I guess, is the big question. Oh, well. You're asking me. <laughs> uh, actually, I remember when I was being strangled with the phone, <laughs> and I was laughing a lot. <laughs> I kept saying, "Come on, you have to do it a little harder, otherwise it's not going to work." <laughs> so, uh, it wasn't that hard. But, I mean, when you imagine, you know, that you're in a scene where you're getting killed and you're vulnerable and blouse is hanging open and uh, <laughs> all kinds of things. Uh, it's not hard to imagine that and you're an actress and that's you know the scene that you're doing. But I do remember that I had to, to ask him to do it a little harder because it wasn't really working. It was sort of tickling my neck and I was like <laughs> oh, we got it. Now Nancy, you had actually worked before with John Carpenter on Assault Precinct 13. I did a lot of screaming in that movie. <laughs> Which is a tremendous film if you haven't seen it. And did you have any sense at the time of just how big a phenomenon Halloween would become and how much of an impact Carpenter in the movie would have across America? No. There's no idea. <laughs> of becoming what everybody wound up referring to as the Nancy Loomis character in basically all of John's early movies. <laughs> now, Tommy Lee, you actually went back a ways with John Carpenter. John and I grew up in the same town, went to the same school. He was a year older, and as everyone knows, when you're that age, that meant like a total gap. We, you know, for uh, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, nothing. But then we started making friends and then we uh, found out we both loved music and got into a rock and roll band together and we've stayed friends ever since. Now you worked on the film as, hey, you had a number of different hats. Well, don't try this at home because production designer and editor aren't compatible, so therefore you get no sleep. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had kind of appeared on the scene with John on Dark Star um, as uh, right. In, I was still in film school, and John had gotten out, and was I come out of art school, so I could handle art department uh, assignments. And then as uh, and then Assault on Precinct 13 came along, sound effects editor came into play because after the movie, I was used to being around like student films. I was like, well, John, give me something to do. Can you cut sound effects? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, fate got, uh, got me a long way. John was kind enough to give me those opportunities. And uh, when uh, Halloween came along, production designer and uh, editor, but I needed help, and uh, Charles Bornstein walked in the door, and we co cut that together. I just want to say one thing, though, going back, just so you know, some of the early relationships is that Nick Castle, Tommy, Lee Wallace and John Carpenter were film school students together, and when John um, went back and, and, and shot some more footage on Dark Store in order to release it as a feature film, uh, <laughs> Nick Castle 
was the alien, the beach ball. <laughs> and so he was our shame. And Nancy, Nancy Loomis also did costumes as well as acting chores. And so I really feel in many ways this was like a company of performers that did both, you know, chores behind the camera and in front of the camera through over a number of movies. And we were a family, many of us were partners with each other in terms of living with each other. And so it was really a wonderful early beginning for all of us in terms of our careers. And Nick, I'm sorry, Jamie. I was going to say, Nick, how do you feel about getting a chance to play two amorphous entities in uh, two of John Carpenter's early films, The Beach Ball and The Shape? Damn proud, really. <laughs> I get, uh, I get uh, mail from strange people. <laughs> I hope it's none of you in the audience. And I get about six, uh, six letters a year from strange people that congratulate me on being the shape, and that was, that was the best shape. <laughs> Since then, I direct my own movies, but they don't care about it. <laughs> Just really happy I was the shape. <laughs> I think the beach ball monster, which is what I call it, because it was a giant beach ball that we painted to be a tomato, was my better role. If you look at that, it's fascinating things. I, I did the clicking with the, with the hands on the beach ball. Go back and get that. It's on DVD now. When, when you go to the actor's studio, that's one of the first classes, is in fact, how to be a giant tomato beach ball. Uh, Jamie Lee, do you have... No, I just was remembering, all of a sudden, remembering the art department, which was like in a little truck. Uh, it reminded me of just the last thing of the movie, and it kind of ties in Dean in a really great way. Uh, obviously, this was my first film, and um, at the time, and I realize now how smart that made me at the time, which, of course, I thought I was an idiot, um, was that I wanted a, mem a memento of the movie. And so I asked Dean if I could have the slate from Halloween, you know, the, clap the clapperboard. Oh, yeah which um, was Dean's personal slate from all the pornos that he had done. <laughs> well, I mean, the adult, oh, no, wait. So, and it was a grown, you know, nowadays they use that digital thing with the thing. This was an old beaten up slate with the a bottom left corner broken off and little pieces of tape that were for the, you know, take numbers, etc. And over the name of the movie was a stack of tape that thick where obviously the you know second assistant camera just kept or third assistant kept putting a new piece of tape for each film um, and over the director the same thing and you know this one just had Halloween and it said John Carpenter and I said Dean I, is there any way I can get us and Dean said you can have this slate well you can only imagine how thrilled I was the problem was that I finished my job in the movie before the last shot of the movie and so. It meant waiting. And so I just, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it, it, you have to understand a little bit about how little the budget was and how hard this was. And th what I'm bringing up is that the house in Halloween is really old. You know, the one where we go up to, at the beginning of the movie, the little boy and I would go up and we go to the scary house. That's how the house really looks. <laughs> That's how the house really looked the day we got there. And the last shot of the movie, the last day of the movie, we finished shooting. And everybody on the crew, led, of course, by Tommy, remade that house to look like the house that you see at the beginning of the movie. And, so, and not an inch outside of camera range. Right, no, I mean, literally window dressings and paint only where you would see it. And this was this major one-shot steady cam. Ray Stella was the camera operator. You know, perfect. Mr. Ray of Hollywood, please. My hands were the well, hands. Well, and so you have to remember that we all put that house together, we all painted, we all hung drapes, you know, as a group. And then that night, once it got dark, they rehearsed when it was light. And then when it got dark, it was this scene to shoot this one shot. Now, Deborah had the, the outfit, the clown outfit on, and when you see him go, the camera go into the kitchen and open the drawer, Deborah's hands, little hands, because she has, look at, tiny little hands. And you also have to understand that we had very few lights and very few crew people. And so each light had to be moved 
once the camera passed <laughs> and I got to, and I waited outside all night long to watch this final shot be shot. And I remember watching it and you'd see them start and you knew they were in the kitchen and then all of a sudden they'd come, go up the stairs and they'd be up in that bedroom and then you'd hear cut and it'd be go, ah, oh, oh. <laughs> And then they'd start it over and you'd see these grips kind of running, you know, with the light, in and, and then window. ducking in the window and hiding behind a door so that the camera could go by. And it was really, I mean, it was really, really rough to make. And, I just have this image when you talk about it as sort of a family feeling on the movie. It was never more evident to me than that night when literally we all painted and dressed this house and then watched this funny little dance go on and then finally end up with, with the scene as it is, which, you know, at, at, for, at its time was a big deal. And so I just, it was that to me is probably my favorite memory of this whole movie, both as a feeling of a, a you know, a, a camaraderie as well as just how weird this was. It was just weird. And th at the end of that, Dean uh, gave me that slate, which hangs in the wall in my house today. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, while I've got the mic, and I just have to do this because if I don't do it right now, I'm going to not do this. Let me just tell you, I, I happen to be the, a phone company representative now, a direct result of my Halloween experiences. Don't ask me why. And this is what I do for my phone commercials. This is the ringer on my phone when it rings. I'm not joking, all right? Here I go. Oh, oh, I knew this was going to be this. Okay. <laughs> Talk to somebody else. I'll come back. <laughs> I, if, I, I was just wondering, Jamie, if, if I could borrow that slate because the stack of tape and tape, I'm, I'm missing some information on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> I need to back. Don't think I haven't tried to steam off those pieces of tape, too, but they're really gummy and they've obliterated the tape marks. Okay, you just keep talking and when I'm ready, I'll talk to you. Well, your, your early career is sounding more and more interesting. <laughs> you shot Halloween widescreen, as Jamie Lee just described really beautifully. You did some very, very intricate camera moves using a kind of very early steady cam outfit. Could you talk about just how difficult it was to shoot the film and how you were able, able to overcome some of those challenges? Well, it, um, first of all, I have to say that, that for me, Halloween was this great breath of fresh air because uh, if, if you did go into those layers of tape, you know, and found out that the various films that uh, actually Deborah had worked on some of them with me, um, I often <laughs> describe them as, uh, you know, low-budget, non-union action-adventure films, <laughs> which, they, which they were. Essentially, they were girls with machine guns. I remember one name, yeah. Ilsa, harem keeper to the oil sheets. <laughs> but no, they're, you know, Satan's cheerleaders. <laughs> Working with John was such an, an interesting, unusual experience because most of the time the directors I'd worked with used the camera to kind of record actors talking um, and things blowing up. And John was such a visual storyteller that I said, wow, this is really why I got into this business, to be able to use the camera in this way and to be able to, to tell a story visually. Um, and that was a lot of the, uh, the great experience I, I got out of it. Um, that, that opening shot with the Steadicam was one of those sort of groundbreaking things. The, the Steadicam had just been invented. Uh, it had been used, I think, on Bound for Glory for kind of a showy shot, but for the most part, people were still trying to figure out what to do with it. Now, the, the, originally, everybody said, oh, well, this is going to replace the dolly. We'll never, ever use the dolly again. But they were thinking of it in old terms, and John thought of it in a, in a new kind of uh, way. Um, and we did a shot that was, um, you know, for the, for the time, quite amazing. And uh, you can still look at it and say it's a pretty interesting shot. Oh. Dive right in. Ready? This is my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're in a store somewhere and uh, you hear that, and then you see it's me, you can actually go, wow, that's cool. <laughs> I actually just had one more thought. Oh. 
don't even think about it. It's not nearly as cool as laughing about also this morning was just, you know, movies became so polished and, and obviously you stop having that kind of guerrilla filmmaking kind of experience. It's the only time I've ever had it. And one of the examples was shown to me this morning in the LA Times. There was an article on John um, in the LA Times. I'm sure a couple of you saw it. There's a picture of me. Well, when you get home tonight, look back at that picture and maybe even in the movie tonight, look at this one scene. It's the scene at the end when the kids come out of the closet you know, what happened, I killed him, you can't kill the boogeyman, ah! <laughs> you know, I push them back into some safe area, I then go in the closet and the, and the movie. It would be obviously an arduous shooting schedule. Uh, at one point during a lighting setup, which there were very few actual lighting setups, but during one actual, I think, 15 minute lighting setup, um, I fell asleep on a couch. And it turned out to be a corduroy couch. <laughs> and I went into one of those really sick, deep, you know, snoring sleeps and then was woken up to do the scene. And when you watch the movie, I have a corduroy couch. <laughs> and the picture in the LA Times today, you can see the impression of the corduroy couch on my cheek. And of course, at that time, nobody airbrushed pictures of the stars of their movie. So it's just another one of those weird little things to kind of let you know how tired we all were, how hard it was, um, and you know, what babies we were. And it just, I saw this picture in the LA Times this morning, and it just made me laugh. Corduroy in my face. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'd like to make a, just talk about, just a moment, about the first time this film was ever shown to a paying audience. Because that was quite an experience, and I think, Deborah, you were probably there, I'm sure we were there. And this was at the Village the, uh, the General Cinema Theater in Westwood, which was a big risk, because I had shown the film to every major distributor, and nobody was interested in even coming. So we showed this picture to a thousand people in Westwood, and we were warned not to do it because you had a lot of kids from UCLA, a lot of sophisticated wise-ass kids, <laughs> and we knew that we were taking a risk, but I believed in this movie implicitly, so <clears throat> the movie started, and it was very quiet for a while, and then about halfway through, the laughs started to come, and I started to feel down my seat just like this, and the laughs started to come, and they kept coming, and kept coming, and I thought, my God, what did we do? What's wrong with this movie? I couldn't understand it, because I, I thought the picture was playing great. Finally, the last time that Jamie Lee Curtis dropped the knife, somebody yelled out, You dumb bitch, you deserve to die. <laughs> then, I, then I knew we had a hit. But, but it, what we found out later on was that it was nervous laughter, total involvement, and that we had done something very special that they had created and, and reached an audience in a visceral way that, in my opinion, hasn't, had not been done quite that way before. And I then took the film all over the country, distributing it, and found that same reaction everywhere. And it was the most fun to watch audiences respond, and I think we may experience that again tonight. It's going to be interesting to see. By the way, my autobiography is called You Dumb Bitch, You Deserve to <laughs> I don't want to blow any secrets here, but uh, Halloween it is set in the Midwest, I believe, but that's in fact not where it was shot. Uh, could you talk a little bit about where this was in fact actually filmed and the problems that you had trying to make the location look like somewhere in the Midwest? Well, they were really Tommy's problems, but uh, no, but seriously, the film takes place in Haddonfield, Illinois, and I'm from Haddonfield, New Jersey, where I was a babysitter. So I really wanted to write something familiar, and that's what we did. We put it in Illinois because we thought it was in the middle of the country, and we wanted something that was sort of, you know, scary, you know, sort of like eerie Indiana, you know, kind of feeling. And um, we ended up um, shooting on two orange groves, Orange Grove and Hollywood, right over here, where Starline tours um, every day bring three or four buses through, talk about the filming. Also, too, on Orange Grove in Pasadena, where the Michael Myers house was. Um, we, uh, we shot it in March, so um, we had no fall. We had lots of palm trees. We 
literally, I mean, framing, just framing was exactly how this film was art directed to the frame. And we had a big bag of fall color leaves, which we threw out in front of the, the, the yeah, camera the bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so afterwards we'd collect the leaves. And uh, we had like, I think we found like maybe six pumpkins, and keeping these pumpkins fresh over four weeks was yeah, really hard. They were South American things that looked like pumpkins, only they were green, and so all the pumpkins in Halloween are painted orange. <laughs> So it was utilizing as, I mean, you know, just so, for those of you who don't know, um, John and I wrote the movie for free, John directed the movie for free, I produced the movie for free, um, the actors worked for scale, the, the crew worked for, I mean, can't believe it, how little. Um, Dean Cundy had this fabulous van called the movie van, which was no larger than a van, which was the grip, electrical, and camera truck. <laughs> and, um, I mean, the money's up there as much as we had on screen, and it was, it was movie making, it was the kind of thing where you didn't throw money at the problems, which so often happens today while budgets are just being driven up and up and up. It was about a group of creative thinkers who were friends, who cared for each other, who just worked beyond to try to come up with this movie and put it together, right? That's right. Everybody, I mean, it's, it's like literally bring your wardrobe to the set and we'll choose it for you, you know? So that's exactly how we worked. Now, speaking of creative problem solving, Tommy Lee, I know some people have heard this story before, but if you could recount it for those who haven't, about the design of the mask. <laughs> well, um, as the production designer, one of my assignments was to find something for the, uh, I guess it really should have been costume, because it was something people wear. But uh, anyway, come up with a, a mask that the shape should, wouldn't, wouldn't wear. And so I went out and found two different masks. One was, uh, I thought a clown would be pretty eerie. I was pretty right years later when I did it. <laughs> but um, I, I bought a clown mask and, uh, and a William Shatner mask. <laughs> I, we, weren't, we weren't letting on at the time. I, it was like kind of a big secret. Anyway. Um, and the clown mask was the old Emmett Kelly classic clown with the cigars, that uh, kind of mask. And the William Shatner mask, I knew I had to do something because it did kind of look like William Shatner. <laughs> and uh, so I pulled off the sideburns and cut the eye holes bigger and spray painted it appliance white and kind of kinked up the hair, kind of made it funky. And uh, <clears throat> then we got in that little bitty place that Jamie Lee was talking about, little, little offices. We auditioned the clown first. Uh, Nancy was the costumer. She came up with a jumpsuit kind of thing so that the rest of the outfit didn't matter. It sort of just fell away. You didn't really notice. It was all focused on that face. And the Emmett Kelly guy came. Nick, was Nick modeling it? I, I can't remember. Anyway, um, first we tried the Emmett Kelly look, and it was eerie. It was scary. It was, oh, man, that's, that's going to work great. It's, oh, you know. Uh, yeah, we can see a, a funny clown, but it ain't funny at all. <laughs> and uh, then um, out came the William Shatner mask, and it, it sent a chill. Uh, <laughs> question from, from the second it appeared, it was, oh, oh shit. <laughs> that's, that's sick. That's, there's something demented about a guy who would put on a mask to look sort of normal. 